we have seen in several of our paper reviews the importance of domestication, the development of farming and husbandry for the transformation of human populations. In this review, we will start with an overview of the history of domestication using the paper Current Perspectives on the Future of Domestication Studies in PNAS, and then take a case study of barley and its spread throughout Asia from the paper Barley Heads East, Genetic Analysis Reveals Routes of Spread Through Diverse Eurasian Landscapes in PLOS One. The beginning of plant and animal domestication related to food production began globally 12,000 to 11,000 years ago at the end of the most recent ice age and during the transition to the present interglacial period. The data shows that two major chronological periods are of greatest interest, the transition to the Holocene from about 12 to 9,000 years ago and the Middle Holocene between 7 and 4,000 years ago. Dogs were a significant exception and were certainly domesticated in the late Pleistocene before the establishment of agriculture. In the New World, crop domestication occurred thousands of years before animal domestication, whereas the opposite was true in areas such as Africa, Arabia and India. So what is a domesticated plant or animal and how does it differ from its wild ancestor? From a present day perspective, it is possible to recognize suits of common traits that makes up the so-called domestication syndrome and they were key to early selection along the wild to domesticated trajectory. In plants, the syndrome is defined by a wide variety of traits that depending on the species may include a reduced ability to disperse seeds without human intervention, reduction in physical and chemical defenses, reduction in unproductive side shoots, reduction in seed dormancy, bigger seeds, more predictable and synchronous germinization, and in some seed propagated species, bigger and more inflorescence. In animals, these traits include endocrine changes, increased docility, altered reproduction patterns and output, altered coat color, floppy ears, usually a reduction in size and other changes in body proportions. The initial stages involved in domestication were critical because humans acted as firstly as dispersal agents managing the reproduction of cultivated plants and controlling the mobility, range and density of domestic livestock. Secondly, agents of conscious or unconscious selection favoring the reproductive success of particular behavioral or phenotypic variants. And thirdly, ecosystem modifiers. In wheat, barley and rice it took 2000 to 4000 years to fix the non-shattering spikelets phenotype, a key indicator of serial domestication. There are other in indications in the Near East of long periods of cultivation without morphological evidence of domestication, including specific field weed flora associated with morphologically wild cereals and legumes, and large stores suggesting re reliance on cultivated production of morphologically wild species. So when did domestication take place? The figure shows a chronological chart listing the regions where and the time frames over which key plants and animals were domesticated. The number in black circles represents thousands of years before present. Gray dashed lines represent documented exploration before domestication or proposed as necessary lead time to the domestication. Blue dashed lines represent either the management of plants or animals, including translocation or pre-domestication cultivation of plants, neither of which were associated with morphological indications of domestication. Red bars frame the period over which morphologically changes associated with the domestication are first documented, and the short solid red bar represents the latest time by which domestication occurred. Although early Holocene plant domestication took place independently 
In both the Old and New Worlds, early Holocene animal domestication was restricted to the Near East. In addition, the majority of plants and animals on this list were domesticated in the Middle Holocene. Now let's look into a specific case, barley. Barley is one of the world's most important crops. It was domesticated in the Near East around 11,000 years ago. It is a highly resilient crop able to grow in a varied and marginal environment, such as in regions of high altitude and latitude. Archaeological evidence from Southwest Asia shows that two road Riffelrikis, wild barley was being used for at least 10,000 years before the fixation of the Thorikis trait. This trait is often taken as the marker of domestication. Subsequently, domesticated barley moved out of the Near East into Europe, North Africa and Central, South and East Asia. In Europe, domesticated barley first appeared at the sites in the Aegean from the 9th to the 7th millennium BC. From there it spread along a northern trajectory through central Europe, following Donau and Rhine river valleys through central Europe into the northern European plain, with further dispersals into the British Isle and Scandinavia, such that barley cultivation reached the Arctic Circle by late Bronze Age. Barley cultivation also spread by a southern route along the Mediterranean coast through Italy to Iberia. In North Africa, the earliest barley with naked forms was in Morocco by 5500 BC. The lack of evidence for farming in other regions of North Africa suggests that the Southwest Asian crops could have arrived in the area through a maritime route, most likely from Italy or the Iberian Peninsula. Turning to the eastward spread of barley cultivation through Eurasia, six road barley was the predominant crop in the Indus civilization, situated at the boundary of the Iranian plateau and Indus flood plains. From the 7th millennium BC, both hulled and naked types are found at archaeological sites dating to the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC across northern and central India, and in southern India by the late 1st millennium. BC. From evidence at sites in Turkmenistan, barley had spread further east into Central Asia by the 2nd millennium BC. By the 3rd millennium BC, barley cultivation was widespread in many parts of China and had reached Korea and Japan. There are several paths with which barley may have reached Eastern Asia. The paper uses genetic to map the history. They present the following chronology for the spread of barley cultivation across Eurasia. Firstly, several barley gene pools with different morphological features and flowering time genotypes spread through the inner Asian mountain corridor in the second millennium BC. From there, barley dispersed further north and east into the first millennium BC. Secondly, a distinctive lowland gene pool of barley spread eastwards to the south of the Indian Plateau in the 5th and 4th millennium BC and through South Asia, hugging the boundary of the Tibetan Plateau with states in northern India during the 3rd millennium BC. Thirdly, a maritime route from South Asia to China, Korea and Japan. Fourth, a high altitude spread on the southern edge of the Tibetan Plateau. Fourth, a distinctive gene pool spread around the southern edge of the Tibetan Plateau, possibly entering the plateau from its western or southern end in the early 2nd millennium BC. This gene pool is also in the northeastern plateau by 2000 BC. Fifth, during the 1st millennium BC, two barley gene pools were dispersed in Xinjiang to the north of the Tibetan Plateau, at least 1000 years after the spread to the south of the plateau. These gene pools could have moved through the Tian Shan corridor from the east to west or from west to east. Sixth, a high altitude spread in the northern steppe dispersed northwards from southern Central Asia from the late 2nd and early 1st millennium BC.
And finally, seven, a tow stage spread into Japan by a northern gene pool spreading into Hokkaido through the Russian Far East in the mid to late first millennium BC and a different gene pool spreading into Japan from the south also during the late first millennium BC. That is all for today. Thank you for listening. Till next time, I wish you all the best.